Well, hello and welcome to a very special episode of Blues Talk with myself, Dale Moon, and Callum Denning. Our head of communications, Colin Tatum, sits down with a blues god, a blues legend. It's none other than Trevor Francis, the million pound man doing a book launch, doing the rounds, promoting his newest autobiography, One in a Million. He'll be at St Andrews on Saturday ahead of the Wigan game doing a book signing in the club store as well, unearthing some untold stories from a glistening career. The Blues Talk Podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning. Trevor, good to see you again. And yourself, likewise. (laughs) One in a million. Do you feel like one in a million? Um, no, obviously the million uh, is mentioned because that's the tag that will never disappear. Yeah. You know, at times, you know, when I get invited to uh, various footballing functions, whether it be a lunch or a dinner, I'm always introduced as the first million-pound footballer. And at times, I think, is that all I did in my career? You know, I take great pride in the fact that I played professional football from the age of 16 till I was uh, 39, 23 years. A uh, couple of European Cup winners' medals, 52 England caps. Um, but I would always be regarded as the first million pound footballer. And I never quite realised at the time just the significance of it. It was big, of course, in them days. But it's something that's never, ever gone away. Mm. C- can you quantify it? put into words for us what it was like then because it was such a huge thing now we're looking at 200 million pound players Neymar and Bappi but then it was such a huge deal wasn't it I don't think it really matters so much now it doesn't carry that uh, you know that excitement you know the, the um, you know the the interest now um, I heard you mention there and Bappi and Neymar and, I mean if you said to me what is the official figure now I, I wouldn't be able to tell you because I don't think people are so interested. It's really gone out of all proportion. It's quite ridiculous, the transfer fees. At the time, um, you know, Jim Smith was my manager here at Birmingham, and he made it very clear that that's the figure that was, would only be accepted, nothing less. Um, so it, it kind of eliminated a lot of clubs you know, from, the, um, from the race to sign me. There were two remaining, Coventry and Nottingham Forest. And I consider myself fortunate that Forest were one of them teams because they were a good team, the only team who could really challenge Liverpool. So, and I had the opportunity of playing for Brian Clough. It meant so much in them days, and it still does, to be fair. You know, it's it's a tag that um, it actually doubled the transfer fee. Uh, it was half a million at the time. David Mills, I think it was. So um, that was quite something to go from 500 to a million. Um, and of course, Brian Clough flippantly said that it was a pound less than a million, and that's kind of stuck also. I regularly get asked that, you know, when I'm about, you know, was it really a million or was it one pound short? Um, for those who are really, really interested in the exact figure, it was one million one hundred and fifty. <laughs> well, did you did you feel the pressure of that price tag? I mean, what was it like? What were you, 24, 25 when you moved from Blues? 25 years of age um, um, of course you know there was enormous pressure on it. Um, I think pressure comes from playing for someone like Brian Clough who was such a great goal scorer himself so you know any type of opportunity it was always a, a good chance as far as he was concerned um, the pressure kind of lifted a little bit when I scored my first goal that was a bit of a relief And then, of course, you know, at the very last match of the season, I was selected to play in my first start in Europe in a European Cup final, um, turning in a man of the match performance and scoring the winning goal. I felt so much more at ease then, the start of the new season, because, um, you know, I'd justified Brian Clough's team selection. It was a bold decision, 
you know, leaving out Martin O'Neill and playing myself. But I always thought that I would play, and that's not be me being big-headed because you know me well enough. Um, that's never been a problem with me being, having a big head. I've always been very level-headed. But I thought to myself, well, you know, if you've got a match winner that you're able to sort of, you know, use in a one-off game, why would you not use him? Fair comment. When you left Blues, was it a wrench? We know you, you were frustrated at the time because maybe the club had not moved on as arguably it should have done. I mean, could Birmingham City have been a Nottingham Forest? I always try to be honest with my responses to any questions as I've been you know, throughout the book and throughout my career. It wasn't a great wrench to leave Birmingham. But what I would say is that I consider myself really, really fortunate that wherever I've played, I've always left that particular club with good memories. And whenever I go back, I'm always very, very well received. Um, and that applies to every club that I've played at and every club that I've managed. So that tells me one thing. I must have done something right. <laughs> Obviously, as a player, nine, nine seasons, youngest ever debutant for the club. I think when you scored 15 in your first 21 games and you sort of burst onto the scene, you were tagged Superboy. How would you equate that now to, to a modern era? Is it, is it equivalent of when Ray, Wayne Rooney sort of made his mark? Yeah, I was about to say Wayne Rooney. I think, you know, I saw a clip the other day when he was just 16 years of age, you know, scoring at uh, Goodison for Everton against Arsenal, his first ever goal. And he went on to have, what's well, still playing, isn't he, of course, in America. He's had a magnificent career. Um, yeah, things have changed over the years. Mm. The media coverage is different now. Even in them days, you know, there was still huge media coverage. Um, you know, I've spoken about, you know, the interest there was, um, not just locally, but nationwide. It be- I remember the six o'clock news. It was on the six o'clock news. All of a sudden, I felt I'd become important. <laughs> Chatting to some people who probably didn't see you play in, in your prime and for Birmingham, we were trying to work out the sort of equivalent modern day player and had people throw in Thierry Henry Robin Van Persie can I say Colin <laughs> it's in the book um, 99.9% of it is solely from me uh-huh. that's the way I wanted it I wasn't going to do a book with you know the, the author's uh, great input um, you know, obviously, he did a lot of research, did a lot of, you know, behind-the-scenes stuff. But everything is from me, apart from the one little um, line that he wrote. In terms of modern day, he likened me to Mbappé. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, yeah, OK, that's not a bad, <laughs> you know... You'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that. That's not bad. So um, that's, the only, that's the only one in the book. You think he's quicker than you? I'm not sure. I mean, that was my, my, one of my biggest attributes. But, you know, when I left school and came up to Birmingham at the age of 15, I used to come back afternoons to try to practice and improve my sprinting. I used to put the old spikes on, and uh, I say the old, I don't know if they're still, you know, used today, but just practicing because I thought that that's the one area that I needed to improve upon. And of course, it became my biggest attribute. Um, you know, once, when you've got that pace, it's just wonderful to have, you know, and Mbappe is blessed with great pace. What's, what was your favourite memory or memories from your time as a player? I mean, obviously there was those FA Cup semi-final disappointments, which I know must have hit you hard. I had nine years, and despite the fact that quite a few of them were a struggle, um, I really enjoyed my time at, at, at Birmingham. And there was a time, you know, as, as the years progressed, and I started to get a little bit frustrated because, you know, we were never, ever, you know, near to winning anything, apart from the FA Cup on two occasions, but I'm, I'm talking primarily about the league. Um, 
you know, of course I started to get a little bit frustrated, but I honestly thought that I was going to play all of my career at Birmingham City. Really? Yeah, because, you know, three or four times transfer requests were not back. It's only when Jim Smith came and he, he was so, so honest. He said he'll do everything he possibly can to get me away as long as I, you know, put in, um, you know, the next three or four months great effort to try and improve the, the club's position. He was, you know, fiercely ambitious. And I said to Jim, I said, listen, you, you don't even have to ask that. Take that as a given. You know, I will give you absolutely everything I possibly can. And he was true to his word, Jim. He, um, you know, he allowed me to move on. But I really thought, no, I, there was a time when I thought, I'm going to play all of my career at Birmingham City. Interesting. Yeah. Was there a time back then as well, which is probably, probably young in your career, really, your playing career, that you thought you'd be back at the club one day as a manager? Were you always going to go down that route? And did you always think that, you know, I'd like to come back one day to St Andrews and, and manage this club? I did. I did. But when you go into management, it's, you can't plan. It's mm. like as a player. You can't plan one's career. I think you can now. Mm. I think all that changed with the Bosman ruling. You know, because they carried all the cards, you know, the, the football club. And you did basically as they said. I think today, if you're clever and you've got um, an astute agent and you're a, you're a good player, I'm not talking about, you know, an average player, one of the good players, top players, he can perhaps go to a club for three or four years, then think, well, OK, I'm then going to move somewhere else. I was reading Lukaku the other day where his agent was saying... Uh, end of the season, he's going to talk to Manchester United because he does like to travel and experience, you know, different uh, countries playing. So that's what I'm talking about. You could have 12, 13 years, you know, th as a footballer, where you could play for three or four clubs. Um, that wasn't, you know, possible in my time. When you did come back as manager in 1996, fair to say that you helped get the club on a probably a more professional footing to, to, to sort of challenge to get back into the top flight yeah when I was asked to come back I knew that it, I had to do it because you know Birmingham will always be in my blood mm -hmm. it's you know I've played for a lot of clubs managed a lot of clubs of course I look for their results Birmingham will always be first I was born in Plymouth but this is my home and I've so I thought when Birmingham came, I knew I was going to take the job, but I was also a little bit nervous because the relationship that I built with the fans over a nine, ten year period was, okay, I'll use the word unique, and I believe that. I think when you're actually living in the city of Birmingham in them early days in the 70s when I was Superboy <laughs> and I couldn't do anything wrong and... Uh, you know, it was just wonderful to play with such, playing so relaxed, with such confidence. Because even if I made mistakes, it didn't matter. I was the young kid and, and the Birmingham fans wanted so well of me. I don't think anyone outside of Birmingham would fully understand just what that relationship was like. I've likened it possibly to Shearer when he went to Newcastle or even Keegan when he went to Newcastle. But that relationship that I had with the Blues fans... I always talk about, there was one instance when it was 72, uh, 10 days fortnight before the uh, semi-final against Leeds. Um, I remember it vividly because Don Revy was at the match and we had a free kick. Um, we were playing against Blackpool and the goalkeeper was John Burridge. And it was probably... I'm loath to say 40 yards out, but it was close to 40 yards. That's how far out it was. And I remember the two big centre-halves went forward and I was on the ball and I was going to clip it into a forward area for the centre-halves. But the cop was shouting to a man, shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> and I listened to them. I spot the ball, spun the ball down, took a run and just thought, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive this as hard as I possibly can. And of course, I'm right behind it, and it's gradually rising into the roof of the net. 
a despairing dive from John Burridge, but he couldn't get near it. And, you know, that was an assist for 10,000 fans <laughs> on the cop. Because that goal would never have happened without them fans there. There's great memories as a player, and there's also great memories as a manager, even though didn't quite get over that final hurdle. If I can just take you to the, the Worthington Cup final, I think I've said this to you before, Trevor, that I remember afterwards coming out of the stadium, I was walking past the coach, and I did a double take, and you were on the front seat, just staring into the distance. You looked absolutely shell-shocked, whatever, however you want to describe it, but it really hurt you that, and, it, and you were almost alone with your thoughts, yeah. and, and, it, and it got to you so much, didn't it? Because you'd taken this club so close to, to winning a major honour. Yeah. I, I take you know defeat badly at the best of times, but even more so when you feel that you've been, I don't want to use the word cheated, but if there's another word that you could possibly think of that um, you know doesn't come to mind, um, and you know what I'm referring to, mm -hmm. is the fact that there was a penalty, you know, that okay, we've been given one, but we clearly should have been given another one from David Ellery. And it's all about what may have been. Mm. I was incredibly proud, you know, to be the manager of Birmingham City, leading my team out, or my club out, in a big, uh, in a big final, against one of the iconic clubs in world football, Liverpool. So very, we were very much, you know, second favourites, underdogs. And we took them all the way to a penalty shootout. I mean, we played most of extra time, almost with ten men, with Martin O'Neill hobbling about. So I was incredibly proud, and you know we could have won it, um, we didn't. But that's the story of my managerial mm -hmm. career. We were also always so close, yet didn't quite achieve uh, success. I mean, it's interesting. I think I've said to you before that success in a football league season over forty-six games. It's getting into the, obviously, getting automatic, but getting into the playoffs. But then 10 days later, when you get knocked out, it's huge disappointment. Mm. It's not success then. Not getting into the, the, the Premier League uh, on three occasions, having got to um, the semi finals. And actually, of the six games, to win three and lose three is it, quite unusual and not get to a final. Mm. Um, and of course, the Preston one, of course, um, you know, the way it goes real, anywhere else it would have counted, but it didn't count in, in, in what was the Football League. But the disappointment was felt greater for me, not getting the team into the Premier, Premier League and, and losing it at the Millennium. As disappointed as I was at losing against Liverpool, it didn't match the, the playoffs. Just going back to the Cardiff one quickly, have you come across David Ellery in the years since have you bumped into him <coughs> yeah. spoken to him yes and what was his uh, what was his view shall we say <laughs> Colin you, you've come to know me over the years um, I have great respect you know for my elders I was brought up in the correct way respect you know policemen and teachers as I did my owners um, and I respect referees. I think most referees will tell you that I was always more than fair with them. So I would not have gone up to David Ellery and said to him, listen, you know, you know you dropped the <laughs> there. <laughs> hey, I would have liked to have done, but I just wouldn't do that. The playoffs, as you mentioned, three years in a row, it's quite unique, twice on penalties as well. Oh. Would, would you, the team, have done anything different in any of those three games? I know it's easy to look back now with hindsight. Um, do you know, I would need a lot of time to answer that question <laughs> because... Um, no, listen, I'm not trying to you know, fudge the, 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 the issue, but I can't, I can't really think at this minute you know, what I would have done differently. Um, why have you got something in mind? <laughs> no, it, it, it was ironic in the, in the penalty shootout. I think we, we missed the, the, the first one on each occasion, which I don't know if that set a tone. And then I think at Preston, the first two were missed. So I don't know I if remember that... Paul Furlong was our regular penalty yeah. taker, and 
I had such confidence in Paul. He's a great penalty yeah. taker. The Watford game this one. Yeah. He missed, didn't he? Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. But no, I mean, I, I, listen, you know, I can't exactly remember, you know, um, you know, of course I remember the, the games and uh, I remember the last one at Preston mm-hmm. when, you know, we. I mean, the goal was offside, wasn't it? The goal, the goal that Preston yeah. scored, and that was it. And then, yeah, the famous Stan Lazaridis goes through. Exactly, he could have put the ball in the building site. It rolls across the line. They go down the end and score. Yeah, I don't know. It, it seemed everything was yeah. sort of conspiring in, on that evening, wasn't it? But we, we could have and we should have, you know, got through in those, you know, those, those semi-finals. I saw them differently. Like I've said to you, that we were second favourites against Liverpool. At no time did I think in those semi-finals, you know, playoff semi-finals, were we, you know, second favourites. I always thought that we could have and should have, you know, got through. So, uh, yeah, they were, they were hugely disappointing. They really were. Mm. Mm. You mentioned the owners a little bit earlier. Obviously, you had a very interesting relationship with them, but again, you, as you said, you were in a position of authority. Their manager, you respected them, but. The, it's no secret about it that there were some fraught moments, weren't there? Yeah, and I think that, um, that, that the, the way that they, they managed the club, um, you know, anyone that worked under them would always have their moments. But we also had some you know, great moments mm. away from football. Um, and I'm a great believer that you have to differentiate between you know, the, your private friendship and your business friendship and when the day comes you know when um, it's 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 you know it, we're going to part company then I'm a great believer in shaking hands and basically saying well you know thank you you know I've enjoyed my time it's been great you know working for you and we move on and we remain good friends but unfortunately, that doesn't always happen, and I find that incredibly strange, mm-hmm. and I don't like it. And you know, the the parting of my time with you know with Birmingham, it, it wasn't as I would have liked, um, which is unfortunate. And uh, I go into into detail with that in the in the book because I think it's unsatisfactory. You know, if I have a problem, you know. With, with them, you know, throughout the, my time there, of course there's going to be problems. You can't have five and a half years where everything's going to be hunky dory. It's impossible. Mm. But you know, when you, when you f- you finish your your relationship and you, they, you you move on, they move on to another manager. Why can't you still remain good friends? Technically, you had two spells as Birmingham City manager, didn't you? <laughs> yes. And <laughs> do you know the first one? I actually forgot about that because I didn't mention it in the book. Really? No, I, I totally forgot about it. So uh, that was a miss of me, you know. That was, um, you know, when, uh, yeah, I remember it now, but uh, yeah, that was an error <laughs> by me. And uh, when it did. You're, you're referring to the fact when I finished? No, when, when, when um, you resigned for two yeah, days and then right. obviously, yes. in, I think it was. Um, March, wasn't it? March 98, yeah. I think it was. Well, I think some Birmingham supporters will be interested to hear what I had to say about that, mm. and uh, unfortunately, uh, I haven't s- spoken about it. Interesting, that. Yeah. It was a mass- massive thing at the time, wasn't it, if you remember? Because it was, will you, won't you, what's happened here? And yeah. I think it was, from your perspective, I'm not putting words into your mouth, but it was a point of principle more than anything, wasn't it? It was. I should have... Um, written about it maybe that could be in the next the next edition yeah yeah I'll take my 10% there (laughs) (laughs) and there's one one player I've always wanted to ask you about just to sort of clarify is Christian Paulson he didn't play for Birmingham City but he was quite pivotal sorry pivotal towards the end wasn't he he was a a player that Danish under 21 international and up and coming rising star that you wanted to bring into the club. Yeah, and you don't always have the opportunity, you know, to follow a player over a period of time, to watch him and scrutinise him very closely. But, you know, because of situations, you know, where there might be a serious injury and you've got to go out and quickly bring in a player, 
Christian Poulsen, I remember watching him play for Denmark under 21s. He was then playing in Rome, um, either against Lazio or Roma, I can't remember, um, in the Champions League uh, for, for Copenhagen. And we really liked him. And we agreed a fee. Personal terms were agreed. No, sorry, we agreed a fee. Let's get this right. And he, he was invited over um, to St Andrews with his mum and dad. And he was ready to sign. And the policy was, or the procedure was, that always I would be given um, a ballpark figure of where I could go. Nothing was set in stone. And, you know, I would negotiate, you know, with the player. And, of course... I'd have to get the uh, the nod, you know, from Karen or from David Sullivan. The situation changed. I was on my way down to St Andrews to meet the player, mm. excited, because, you know, with his mum and dad there, that he had come to sign for us. And I got a call from Karen, and she said, um, don't uh, start any negotiations until I arrive. And that was a change in strategy. And I... I thought, you know, I can read into this. Mm -hmm. When we got to the ground, met up with Karen. Karen made the opening, uh, you know, conversation, made an offer which totally shocked me. It was well, well below I ever imagined. The player never even gave it consideration. And sadly, that was the end of... Uh, negotiations clearly um, the offer was made purposely for him not to sign and I started to read into this yeah. situation because that was really the start of things you know for me um, and Christian Poulsen you know went on to have a fantastic career um, played so many times for the national team World Cups played for the great Juventus, played very well at Liverpool. He was what I would consider to be a proper player. <laughs> Talking of proper players, um, best player you played with at Blues or your most favourite player you played with at Blues and also who would you say your best Blues signing was as a manager? Put you on the spot here, I know. But, uh, yeah, it's another one of them really tough, tough questions. <laughs> um, it's like the other day I was asked a question, um, who's the best 11 players you've ever played with? I said, I need about two hours to work that out. I don't think I need two hours to work this out, but best player I ever signed. Um, Maybe in value in terms of what that player brought for you, brought for the team over a period of time. Hmm. Sorry about the delay here. <laughs> um, I know I'll think of somebody later, but I think Gary Rowett. Um, I mean, he was a million pound. I can't think of many right backs that were better than Gary. Obviously, he was versatile, could play as a centre half. Um, we sold him for three million, mm. and then he also became uh, the manager of Birmingham, which gives me enormous satisfaction. Um, Steve Bruce on a free transfer, that was, that was good. Um, Steve, once again, you know, went on to manage the club. And it's a special feeling, you know, for me, when one of my players, or two of my players in this case, go on to actually manage uh, the club. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody else. Um, who could I say? Um, I always thought that Brian Hughes was a very talented player. I like Brian very much. We played against them in the FA Cup. That was his team, Wrexham. <laughs> and I signed him. Um, in a 4-4-2 at times, he was a little difficult to, to get, get him into a central position. He wasn't quite strong enough. So he often he played for me on the left-hand side. But he had a... He was a great finisher yeah. and had an eye for a goal. I think in the modern day game where, where teams don't play 4-4-2, I think he would have been an even better signing. 
Um, but of course, most teams, as I did, played four four two in those days. Um, go on, you, you name one or two. Go on. No, I, I would have said probably Brian Hughes and, as you said, Steve Bruce, Gary Ablett. Um, God bless his soul. Really shrewd signings, really, weren't they? Can I mention Martin O'Connor? And I was going to say skip Martin O'Connor. Martin yeah. O'Connor was um, a good midfield player, solid, solid citizen, good captain, good type to have around, and um, you know he had great energy and a, a good understanding of the game. Um, I liked him. I liked Martin I think very that much. Pairing with him and Chris Mars, and again another un- underrated player, Chris Mars. Wasn't Thank he? you for reminding me. Th- those two in that engine. Chris room there. Marsden had a magnificent left foot. Very, very talented. I always felt that he was um, not um, accepted uh, like he should have been by the Blues fans. Um, he was a little bit um, one paced, but he had a left foot that you could die for. I mean, it was like a wand. Mm. He was very, very talented, uh, Chris Marsden. I thought he was a good signing and a very, very good player for us. What about a player that you played with at Blues? Played with? Favourite player, a teammate or oh, best player? Oh, I, I think or? I'd have to say Bob Latchford. Bob, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, as a front two, we were um, a handful. You know, both of us had England careers. Um, Bob was a very, very good goal scorer. Um, so he was, I think, I, I've said that probably Freddie Goodwin's best ever signing was Bob Hatton mm. he was um, for the money that he paid for him was a great bit of business and you know helped to form what is probably the best front three blues I've ever had you know Hatton Latchford and myself um, Malcolm Page was a good good player great servant still is to the club um, played you know numerous times for his country um, I used to like Alan Campbell in midfield, Scottish under twenty three, international. Alan was a good player. Um, yeah. And if I uh, mention the name Christoph de Gary, there's, 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 there's always a debate. Now, who was Birmingham City's greatest ever player, most talented ever player, Trevor Francis or Christoph de Gary? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, people are entitled to their opinions. I mean, you know, there would have been uh, a lot of supporters who. Would never have seen me play, and uh, so you know they're only making judgments on you know clips on YouTube, I suppose, and what their their parents have mm-hmm. told them. But um, no, I think that you know Dugari was incredibly talented, um, you know, World Cup winner, you know, with with France. Um, there is a slight difference, you know. I did it for nine years; he did it for nine months. <laughs> Trevor, it's great to talk to you. And just, just, um, is that just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. just finally, <laughs> if you had three words to sum up your time at Birmingham City, both as players and manager, what words would you use? Three words. Three words. You can use four or five if you want. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's a massive chunk of your life, as you said, yeah. isn't it? And it, it, you, you're indelibly tied to this club. Well, I'd use you do. Use the word enjoyable mm-hmm. as, as, a, as a player and as a manager. Um, frustrating. <laughs> um, can't think of a third. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Is that okay? So thanks very much for your time. Okay. It was good to see you. And I know we'll be uh, we'll be seeing you as well on the the day of the Wigan Athletic game. You'll be in the Blue Store. Signing copies of your autobiography, One in a Million. Thank you. Hope to see uh, a lot of the uh, blue supporters coming along and uh, hope they all enjoy the book. I've uh, done my best. That's always been my outlook, you know. In fact, what I've always said is, you know, if you can't do it right, you know, don't do it at all. And I've, I've given it my best. And uh, hopefully, supporters not just the Blues but throughout football, they like you know what they uh, what they read. You know when you think of all the managers that I've played under, 
even if they're not particularly fond of Trevor Francis. You know, I think I'm in a in a in a, in a real you know uh, unusual position, having played for the likes of Jim Smith, Brian Clough, Ron Atkinson, John Bond, Graham Souness, Sir Alf Ramsey, then at international level, Ron Greenwood, Bobby, Bobby Robson, Don Revy. You know, I think to myself, well, there's got to be one or two there that, uh, you know, football supporters, uh, you know, would like to hear about. Because these are some of the most iconic figures in football management over the last 50 years. The Blues Talk Podcast. Blues legend Trevor Francis sitting down with the club's head of media and communications, Colin Tatum, ahead of his visit to the Blues store against Wigan on Saturday morning. He'll be signing copies, of course, of the autobiography One in a Million. But that's all we've got time for on Blues Talk this week. We'll be back next week with the episode that I'd like to say you've come to know and love. You've come to know it, at least. Myself and Dale will be looking ahead to the end of the season. The Blues Talk Podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning.